This is John T. Pierce. I'm editor of Call Center Helper, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today uh, on today's webinar. I think it's going to be a very exciting topic. We've not covered the topic of knowledge management before, uh, so I think it's going to be of interest to everyone. Running through the agenda, uh, I'm John T. Pierce. I'm editor of Call Center Helper. We'll uh, also joined by Dennis Hua. Uh, Dennis is a director of eGain, and will be taking us through 10 signs that you need knowledge management in the contact center. Uh, we'll then hand across to Martin Hill Wilson, who's the director of Brain Food Consulting, who will be taking us through knowledge management in today's customer service environment. Uh, we'll then be looking at five ways to get started with uh, knowledge management from uh, Dennis. Uh, and then we're also joined by Vicky Lister of eGain, and uh, we'll be going through uh, an interactive question and answer session uh, dealing with any questions, any questions we you may have. But before we get into that, what I'd like to uh, do is I'd like to share with you a poll, which is: Do you uh, currently use uh, knowledge management in the contact center? So if I just put the uh, results up there, if you could all uh, just put your uh, answer in there, whether you're using knowledge management technology in your contact center, the answers are yes no and not sure. We've got uh, most people voted. We're still waiting for a few more, few more answers coming through. So it should be just in the little, uh, little poll box you've got coming up. So I think we've got three more people to vote. Two more. I think we're just waiting for one more vote to come through. And uh, I'll just uh, close that and share the results. So currently we've got 43% uh, are using knowledge management in the contact center. 38% aren't and 19% uh, not sure. I guess uh, knowledge management is one of those sort of strange concepts that lots of people are using knowledge management, but whether it's sort of a, it's a formal or an informal situation, I guess would be uh, would be one of the situations. Martin, in in your experience of working with contact centres, would you say that's sort of representative of the of the call centre community? Yes, I would. Um, I, I still don't think it's the majority of people are actually using it. Um, you have, of course, got knowledge management going right the way back to the most primitive form called a post-it note, which would probably mean that more people than not would then have it. But uh, in terms of the way we're talking about it today, I think that's probably uh, quite a generous interpretation. In fact, yeah, I certainly uh, see an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of post-it notes in in contact centres, as indeed uh, and as indeed notepads, and I guess. One of the challenges we move into the eras of PCI compliance, where notepads and post-it notes are increasingly being banned, uh, it creates, uh, creates a, an interesting challenge there. Uh, we're now going to move across to uh, Dennis, Dennis Foy from uh, eGain, who's going to take us through knowledge management in the contact center. Dennis, I'm going to pass the, the baton across to you, and perhaps if you could uh, sort of start with a, with a short introduction, would be great. OK, thanks, John T. Um, I'm Dennis Foy. I'm the sales director for Northern Europe for eGain. Um, eGain is a um, leader, leading vendor in the field of customer interaction software and services. We've been doing this for, uh, for a long time, for over 15 years in fact, and we pride ourselves on the level of interaction and engagements that we achieve with our customers, and that helps us to uh, build stories and, and analogies, I guess. And, we wanted to share some of these with you today in the form of uh, signs, symptoms that we see uh, day to day, but also uh, later on in the day, uh, share some ways of how you could um, uh, start with a knowledge management project and take it out of a theoretical approach and make it more practical for you. Um, let's start with the first of the signs that we see, and it's uh, indeed one that we come across almost daily, um, where different answers are being provoked uh, by an interaction with different customer service agents. Um, what we see that some of that is attributed to the fact that customers apply pressure in a dialogue. This pressure is sometimes manifested in, in a time pressure on some, on, or in patience, as we uh, uh, now have learned to know that. Um, and we also see examples there whereby customers call back and uh, reposition questions uh, with information that they've gathered from previous calls. Um, a very good example that we have come across with one of our customers in the insurance sector is, a, is one where customers were obtaining information for policy cover 
and actually used conversations that um, they had with agents to then call back later, uh, make use of that information to obtain a better result or a ro lower price for that cover. Um, the, the, this, the drawback of that inconsistency is, of course, that it also leads to a large number of repeat calls. Um, another area where this happens is um, different channels. You see that customers are using different channels other than the telephone, email, chat, to obtain different answers and then play them back in conversations. And I guess, in a way, uh, perversely, it brings us back to the scenario of computer says no. Um, sometimes it would be good to have something that enforces a, a policy and the agent could refer to. It would make the conversation stronger, at least aid consistency. Um, another sign that we see that it's really one where the benefits uh, can be driven up um, by implementing a knowledge management solution is the increasing call volume. We just briefly touched on what happens if you're inconsistent and what that does to repeat calls, which obviously drives call volumes. But also what we see is uh, more often than not simple queries that drive the call volume up. And that's a great opportunity to start using your knowledge management more outbound and push some of these questions to a, a self-service over the web what kind of scenario, um, that's a great area to, to look at return on investment there. Another area for us is the um, multiple information um, sources. I guess this is hopefully something that you all can relate to. Information is stored in different systems and we all have to learn how to deal with that and how, how to work with those systems. We, we have CRM systems and they have their own way of navigating or asking us to navigate through the system. Some, some of them are property-based. Um, intranet systems, uh, document management systems, and what we see here sometimes is that the ownership of the systems lie with different departments and they all have the different policies to enforce the use of that system. There are also practical considerations here. Uh, the consideration of how do you remember where things are if you don't use them daily? Um, that's a challenge in itself. Um, and a good indicator for us is when we just touched on this, when we walk into a building and we see those post-it notes, our colleagues and myself look at each other because we usually know that's a great indicator to have a, a conversation around this. I guess we, we would like to hear from you um, about the use of multiple systems to check and validate some of our thoughts. So, John T, would you like to run a poll on this please. Yeah we've just got a, a poll we've put up on the screen which is in, in, to Dennis's point. Uh, how many knowledge sources do your agents currently use in the contact center? The answers are one, two to three, four to five, five to nine or ten plus. So if you'd just like to uh, vote on the uh, number of knowledge sources currently used in the uh, in the contact center, we're getting the uh, votes coming through. It's some quite interesting, uh, quite interesting uh, reading coming through here. Just a couple more people to vote and I think just one more to go there. I'm going to close that off. I'm going to share the results now with uh, everyone and uh, what we see is that um, we've got uh, by far the biggest number is four to five knowledge sources. What's quite fascinating as well is that 15 percent of the audience have got about 10 plus knowledge sources. So uh, Dennis I know you, you visit an awful lot of an awful lot of customers. We, you know, that strikes me as, as uh, certainly 10 plus as, as, as quite a scary, quite a scary number. Yes, 10 is a huge number. Um, as a matter of fact, practical, anything over five, you would think that that's a large number to maintain. And also, you, you've got to ask yourself what happens on a day-to-day -day basis if you don't need some of those sources and how that affects your ability to have a, a, a strong conversation um, with with your customers. Yeah. So I'm just going to. Uh, uh, pass the, the, the baton back to uh, to Dennis. Yeah, I mean certainly on the on on the the whole data reintegration part, I think it's it's certainly one area where uh, as co contact centres we think we've missed a bit of a a bit of a trip there. And I, I guess in some ways it's uh, been quite difficult historically to uh, to integrate those. Thank you, John T. I'll uh, share your screen now. Thanks. There's a great example actually of um, a telco client that we have whereby we've um, 
they had actually a fantastic intranet when all this information was stored. And what they saw is that um, hardly anyone was using the intranet simply because it was difficult to navigate through or to try to find the information quickly. Um, and what we saw there is when we deployed the knowledge base, it increased the use of the intranet by over 400%, which is an astonishing number. Their knowledge base was used quite creatively, actually, to, to make sure that the content was retrievable and findable in, um, in the, on the intranet. Another sign um, of a, a need or an opportunity to deploy knowledge management is, of course, performance and, and the performance gap and variations between uh, your worst and your best agents or your average agents and your best agents. Um, we all know there's a significant and a very large investment up front in the training. Um, what we have seen from our experience is that there's a sweet spot of productivity which typically manifests itself between the first six months to a year where the performance is at its best. Um, if then retraining or ongoing training is not conducted, we see that that performance drops off. Um, we also like to point out here that the best agent is not always the agent that has been working for the organization the longest. Uh, sometimes when we have to drive innovation of best practices, these agents sometimes um, actually institutionalize all the ways of working and sometimes we unfortunately have to move away from that. So there's an interesting opportunity there to use knowledge management and guidance um, to help there. And it would be quite interesting if anyone in the audience sort of agrees with Dennis' point there about the, the, the peak period would be about uh, six months for an agent to get up and running and, and most productive. If you find uh, you, you agree with that, if you want to just drop your comments in the box or if you think it takes a bit longer, if you could uh, drop that as well. Thanks, John. Uh, it would be very useful indeed. And the next point leads into this, um, uh, in particular in light of how long it takes for an agent to be fully productive um, in the organization. And what we see is that if it takes more than three months, we're talking in months, again, there is a, 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 there's a consideration there around how knowledge is deployed at the right time. Um, what we see is a large part of the training when we analyze that is actually around dealing with various different systems, how to obtain, how to incorporate them in your workflow day to day uh, aligned to the type of questions that you get. Um, some of this knowledge is lost after this period, so we have an initial period and if you then don't use it every day, you see that in the last 20% of cases you'll actually have to retrain your staff. Um, this also is true for the launch of new products. Whenever we uh, launch products on a new rate or there are promotions, uh, there is a need to retrain, and the same goes for scripts. And we've got a couple of comments in from the uh, audience on that. Adadeo says, I, I quite agree with that. Uh, it's uh, never by a historical background in the organization, but by performance and, and the ability to, to, to deliver on the spot. Uh, and that's sort of basically built, built through self-development. Uh, Aiden has come back and said, he comes from a, a company with 2,000 agents, and uh, he thinks that sort of two months is the sort of really the maximum time that you've got to get a, an agent really to, to, to buy into your uh, buy into your to your values. Thanks, that's very useful. I think um, I agree with both comments. Um, I guess that the measure of when an agent is productive is the, the challenging one. Um, that there is a difference and a variation between when we've got uh, induction programs and then start to measure what the customer interpretation is on how the agent is doing. Um, it, it's, it's interesting to see that the practice actually aligns with the project that we see. And I guess it's one of those curves that goes up and it's sort of, you know, there's a bit of a difference between 90% 90, 90 effective and, and sort of 100%, I guess. Absolutely. Our next point is um, something that we probably all see uh, and almost have to deal with on a, at least a weekly basis, I would think. Um, the, the avoidable escalations to second line. It's a bit of a paradox, this one. Um, you need an understanding that this something is, could have been done in the first instance. Uh, we all know that second line uh, escalations are more expensive in the way they, they are run. And most businesses are using to, uh, are, are trying to reduce their cost and, and processes should typically move back from the back office to the front office to be more effective in that way. Um, the challenge with this one is obviously that you only know after the facts that it was avoidable and by bringing it forward and retraining uh, you, you learn and you hope for an improvement. Um, 
I guess that hope bit is the bit that you want to remove with the knowledge management. Um, it's great to have fantastic stats on, um, uh, or, or, or on the drive, but you, you want to get yourself into the position you're actively managing this scenario and not sort of managing last month's result. Um, a great example of this one is a, um, um, an online retailing that we had to deal with at some point, and uh, that they had a policy in place that every um, te uh, te technological question was automatically escalated to the second line. Uh, there was a huge number. When we actually looked at those questions, we found that some of the questions could have easily been dealt with. You know, we were talking about television sets and the aspect ratios of those sets. Uh, it could have easily been captured in an in a interesting first line conversation. Our next one is on hold time and wrap time, and I guess what we mean when hold time is typically how long we keep a customer on hold, and in this NH you'd be surprised um, how, long, uh, how much that still happens and how long that time is. And the wrap time is something that's sometimes overlooked, is the time that it takes for an agent to actually close the case. Um, again, we see uh, a very, very long times, um, and obviously that time um, takes away time for the time that you could have available on the phone or on an email or other channels that you may use. Um, putting people on hold whilst you're searching for a resolution is an interesting one. Um, we've become more adept at searching. We're using search boxes, but actually what we see is that these search boxes actually have not led to a reduction in hold time. As a matter of fact, in some cases they've actually led to an increase. Um, uh, we still see examples where complex cases where people are working flat out but they have to interact with other departments sometimes have hold time for up to 10 minutes. Obviously in this day and age with an impatient customer, um, that's a different one. They will probably hang up and call back and ask uh, the question slightly different in the hope of getting a shorter hold time as a result of it. Um, and next one is the best practice um, not being followed by a significant number of customer service agents. I think I, what we see lately is that a lot of organizations are putting a lot of effort in actually collecting, compiling, and documented best effort, which is encouraging. It's, it's a very good thing to do. Where we see, uh, when we start to analyze how many people are actually using these best practices, is that it breaks down. Um, the use is not what you would expect or hope. Uh, after all the work that you've put into trying to make this information available to everyone. Um, and some, there's a simple reason for that. Sometimes they just don't know it's available. Um, uh, sometimes practices change or they are sent over email or they're being kept in a library of information that's, that obviously not a lot of people have got time for to, to look for. Best practice only really works if it's pushed forward to you when you need it. The the need for multi-skilling um, to improve your operational flexibility is something that's very current. Um, I think if you, most of the customer services directors that I speak, um, speak with mention this at some point in the conversation. Um, this is around the capability and the use of uh, the customer service agents to answer questions and serve customers across various uh, uh, brands, uh, functionalities, products. and. Um, more and more organizations are moving to this, to this model. Sometimes um, uh, forthcoming from a from an, um, consolidation uh, after acquisition of multiple contact centers, or sometimes simply driven by the fact that uh, multiple products are being launched and we need agents to be uh, conversant across all those uh, products and topics. This is not the same naturally of being an expert in your project, in your products. Our last one is where everything comes together for us. Um, and this is where growth, consolidation, or uh, the rapid introduction of new products really uh, it is the situation when everything comes together. Uh, this is where the, the largest savings are in these scenarios. You'll see that the training of new staff, the, the introduction of new products, and the lead time for productivity all come together here. Um, and there is some great opportunity here to uh, introduce knowledge management to actually reduce um, some tangible uh, numbers, and particularly aligned to time and calls. Okay, wonderful. We've got some quite interesting, uh, interesting comments coming through uh, on this. So thank you very much, Dennis, for that. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just. Um, we've got one uh, feedback in from Aidan Dunn, who says uh, the best practices are great when you have a knowledge champion <laughs> using them to feedback to the knowledge to knowledge specialist, and I guess that's. Uh, quite an interesting, uh, an interesting comment overall. Um, 
I guess the knowledge champion is probably quite critical to the, to the whole process, would you, would you say? Yeah, we fully agree with that uh, completely subscribed. As a matter of fact, one of the first things that we um, um, uh, try to ascertain when we talk to um, our customers is um, uh, the thought process behind having a team available, whether it be a virtual team or a physical team, that actually um, manages and takes responsibility for the adoption of the knowledge management and the knowledge base. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, we've got a, a poll. We've gone through 10 uh, problems there. Just be quite nice to get a, a, a a sort of checkpoint from the uh, audience of which uh, areas, and you're allowed to vote for up to three different uh, different areas here, of which areas you think of the of the ten, and we, we've sort of grouped them together, are the most important. So is it things such as inconsistent answers, uh, agent knowledge gaps, escalations, hold or wrap times, uh, or core deflection, uh, or self-service? So um, if you'd like to, to vote now, I'm seeing the answers uh, coming through here. Quite fascinating. Um, in fact, it's neck and neck of what the top, <laughs> the, uh, the top one is. Would you, um, Martin, would you like to uh, hazard a guess about what you think the, uh, the winning answer is likely to be? Right. Uh, I think call deflection is going to be pretty hot for people. Uh, and I would have thought hold and wrap times. Ah, and the answer is, <laughs> it's uh, actually inconsistent answers and agent knowledge gaps seem to be the most important to the, uh, the most important to the uh, audience. So, hmm, um, fascinating. Just yep. sh share those uh, results up on, the, up on the screen, hopefully you can see yes, them. Yeah. Uh, so about 74% of uh, cases, inconsistent answers and agent knowledge gap. So I guess that's the, uh, probably comes along to the, the question about uh, making your average agent as best as your, your top agent. And I know there's lots of contact centers I go to, so if we can only bottle up our four or five top agents yes. and spread that goodness uh, across the center. And I guess, you know, knowledge management has really got a, a quite an important role to play within that. And we're now going to go to the part of the agenda where Martin is going to share some of the uh, some of the context now of the overall uh, uh, knowledge management. So, Martin, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself and, and, and take us through it. Thank you very much, John T. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, what I want to do here is to make some links uh, between knowledge management uh, and also um, some of the big themes that we see in call centres. Um, now. I'm just pausing for a second. Can you see my screen at the moment? We've got a big black currently. Okay. Uh, there we are. What's new? It says that. Very good. That's exactly where we want to be. So, um, just to repeat myself there, I'm going to make the links between knowledge management and what really matters in terms of developing ourselves uh, in terms of the next generation. Now, this here is, I guess, one way to summarize. Uh, what we probably all experience, if we have any sense of history uh, around of being in the customer service space. Uh, for a long time, we have been trying to move from a, an efficiency orientated um, uh, obsession, I would say, to one where we have got more effectiveness going on. You could probably summarize that through those two key metrics, average handle time, which I know most of us are still addicted to, but also trying to get hold of the uh, first time uh, resolution, full school resolution. Um, and that is still very much work in progress uh, for most uh, centers uh, and probably from the customer's point of view they know that and in fact if you look at the customer experience you can see that we are still reaping the dividends or the, the consequences of trying to change our focus to be more customer centric. Um, this is a new piece of research um, the interesting point being is I could pretty much choose any point of research and uh, still end up with the same conclusion, but this one happens to be done across uh, EMEA, uh, done quite recently uh, by Forrester, and the question was asked of that particular audience, uh, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the statement, which is that customer service centers always provide excellent customer service? Uh, and if you have a quick look at those answers there, you will see that the green means absolutely, I quite agree with that point, and uh, there's not much green on that uh, table. Um, and it's the red, or the, or, or the uh, yes, the, the red move, which is uh, most important uh, in terms of people saying, no, that's just not my experience. 
Uh, interestingly, uh, it does change by, it does actually change according to territory you're in. And uh, any of you that run uh, international operations and you happen to have a service center in Germany, you might actually choose to phone up your counterpart this afternoon and say, what are you doing that works? Because we don't seem to do it quite so well over here in the UK. But the net result of that experience says about 70% of customers don't think that we provide excellent service. Uh, and if you want to dig a little bit further underneath the psyche, then here's another fascinating statistic um, produced by Paul over at Interspirience. And he's been tracking now for quite a long period of time the, uh, basically the emotional state of customers when they have to interact with us. Uh, and, and you can clearly see that we're moving from a, uh, a more balanced frame of mind <laughs> to one in which we are increasingly irritated, furious, and annoyed with customer service. Um, it's almost doubled, in fact, in uh, seven years. Uh, and look at the bottom stat there as well. Uh, also, most people rate customer experience as being poor or very poor. Uh, and you're almost up to a quarter of people having that experience or basic uh, um, you know, ground of being, I suppose, in terms of interacting. So that's the context, if you want, within which knowledge has got a role to play. So let's ask the obvious question now, which is, uh, OK, since you don't like it, what's important to you? Uh, and it's interesting to look at this because, in fact, the statistics around of what people's first choice are are pretty much evenly balanced. You know, whether it's 39 or 42 percent really doesn't matter. There's a bunch of things that matter to the customer in terms of what they uh, prioritize as being important. So, number one, my query is resolved quickly. I'm able to interact with a customer service representative quickly. Same word turns up. Able to talk to a human being. We know that one. And also, I'm able to access the information I need to resolve my query myself. Now, apart from the fact that I can actually talk to a person, uh, three of those top priorities, it's not too difficult to see the role that knowledge plays in terms of being able to expedite uh, that person's uh, reason for calling and allow them to get on with their life uh, as a result of that. And that's, that, that's a pretty good way of saying what the function of knowledge is meant to be doing. The other thing to be saying is, by the way, thinking about uh, live uh, interaction, thinking about self-service, of course, one of the big themes in today's universe is the fact that we're in a multi-channel environment. Uh, and again, just having a look at this, there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. This particular survey uh, shoves email on top. Interestingly, if you take a look at the difference uh, culturally, uh, different folk uh, want different things according to uh, whether in the UK, fr uh, you know, France, or Germany, you can have that same analysis done by generation, and again, you will see uh, differences. Um, it's also different by marketplace. Um, here, for example, is an analysis of the help desk industry, um, and this is a survey amongst its members, and you can see they actually have got a very broad set of channels they use and a broad set of support systems that they use in order to do their job. Because it's a function of what they're doing, they need those particular things. So adding that together, we've got a requirement to make sure that knowledge is uh, effective in terms of speeding up resolution, but also there is a single version of that truth sitting across what is increasingly a multi-channel environment. Uh, what are organizations? Do they recognize that? Well, it's encouraging they're beginning to. This is another source of information. Uh, for those with beady eyes, you will notice that I've plucked this in the future. This is the second annual multi-channel customer experience report from 2012. So technically, it shouldn't even exist yet, but it's out <laughs> in the marketplace. That, that really is a vision into the future. It is. It is. You're very privileged. I had to do a bit of TARDIS work on this to drag it from the future. And these kind of statements, I'm never entirely convinced about because people have been saying for years that actually the customer experience is important. But nonetheless, there is some implicit recognition at a fairly senior level that, yes, we need to get our act together, uh, particularly around multi-channel customer experience. So, by the way, this is a good slide, and this is a very important slide. And any of you who are trying to justify uh, either multi-channel or knowledge or anything, this kind of information is, is, is really jolly useful. Uh, and what it's saying is, is it worth doing things well uh, outside of your personal belief? Uh, and this slide said absolutely it is, and we can quantify that in terms of the additional purchases, uh, the reduction in churn, and in fact the impact of word of mouth uh, across a whole number of key verticals. 
um, and whether or not your particular vertical is there is, is kind of less significant. It's the fact that actually there is some science being developed around this and ability to quantify it and, and say, get it right, and you can actually impact your top and your bottom line. So that's one way of looking at it from the point of view of the customer. Let's have a look at it now from the other perspective, which is from the point of view of the professional communicator, that person that sits all day pretty much interacting with your customers um, and either makes that experience work or not. What's the significance of knowledge management from their particular perspective? So let's start with a discussion that I'm sure you are engaged with already, hence the word, which is basically if we want to up the customer experience, what do we need to be focusing upon? And uh, this is one of those obvious self-evident truths that unfortunately keeps disappearing from view every so often in the marketplace and we have to rediscover it again but clearly there is a chemistry between customers feeling engaged and our ability to be engaged with them as a brand. Now that's pretty difficult and really social media to some extent is all about that particular challenge at the moment but when it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis in the context of a service centre um, it is clearly that person who is picking up their, I don't know, 94th call of the day, whether or not they can recreate that sense of engagement uh, and rapport that is necessary for the customer to reciprocate that in the sense of going, do you know what, that person really cared about what uh, I was asking for, the way they did it really was good, I, I felt that I mattered as a result of all of that. So the catalyst for actually dragging up the customer experience for you know, improving your NPS, your customer effort score, your customer sat score, whatever you're measuring yourself by, is through that particular piece of chemistry. And actually, we know that. We've known that for a long time. This is uh, uh, some information from, from Steve over at uh, Contact Babel. And a couple of years back, he asked uh, a number of you as call center managers and directors, uh, what do you think is the most important attribute when you go shopping uh, for new talent? And what do you want to most see uh, within success for people um, and the answer quite clearly is empathy that is the single most important attribute uh, in terms of what you're meant to be up to uh, and that kind of figures because you know you can obviously see the relationship between employee engagement uh, and uh, and that now if you dig one level beneath that what drives empathy I would argue what drives empathy as a core competency anyway is listening this is one of my particular soapboxes and uh, if you want to have a definition of listening that is relevant to customer service, I will humbly submit this to you. So I'll just read it out in case uh, you're eating a sandwich at the same time. The goal of customer listening is to capture a full and accurate version of what is being said and then make sense of it in the exact same way that the customer intended. Now, that is a heck of a high standard to do. But obviously, if you do enable that to take place, for the majority of interactions, you are going to be making sure that empathy takes place, rapport takes place, engagement takes place. I would also, by the way, argue that your cross-selling and upselling will work much better because you will be more appropriate in terms of your intervention. But this, the point about that is that you need a single-minded focus and concentration. And look at most uh, uh, service center environments. They are busy, distracting environments either because your person next door is eating sweets and swiveling on their chair, uh, the call center director has suddenly invited another notable person to come down from HQ, somebody's on break, it's just all going on in front of you. So, and by the way, the, the customer sounds like the last 19 customers that they've just been talking to, and you're just going to automatic pilot. So the ability to concentrate is always an uphill battle. And one of the things that is, an in, that is a form of distraction is in the management of the relevant information, which, tracking back to where we started this discussion, was the key thing that customers said was most important to us. Finish that call quickly and accurately and let me get on with my day. And as you can see here, what we generally are doing as far as enabling uh, people to access information really isn't very smart at the moment. We might have individual silos of information, which may be okay or not, but you know what? Probably what's being put on the website is not necessarily the same as the FAQ bucket. It's not going to be the same in the knowledge management system. And the reality is with, cust with call centers which are still averaging around about 30% attrition 
in the UK, and some of us suffer much worse than that. And it takes roughly, according to uh, our poll, two months to get somebody up to speed. It's not very clever to make it more difficult for people to find the right answer to the question. And by the way, if you ever poll people and say, what was your first day like once you've come out of induction, most people will say, quite frankly, it was terrifying. And I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to go on my screen. I didn't know what to say. Uh, and indeed, even the most experienced agents, if they suddenly get subjected to things they're not used to, like a very, very angry customer, whereas that's not normally their job, everyone can get flustered. So if suddenly the information isn't readily at hand, that's a, a surefire recipe for things getting out of control. And, that's and, and you certainly find that in, in an awful lot of cases that results in the supervisor effectively becoming almost like the first level help desk. And I see that, you know, rather than actually building teams and, and coaching and motivating, it is that almost that first level help desk that I, I see in a lot of contact centers. Well, I won't mention the name, but a very, very large one worked in exactly that way, which is basically you put your hand up for the answer and there were real life knowledge bases running around called team leaders. You know, and, and yep. that's actually how, how knowledge works <laughs> in most ways, post-its and team leaders at the end of the day. So actually raises an interesting point. You know, one of, one of the uh, developments, if you want, around knowledge management, nobody disagrees with the theory of it, it's how to make it work in practice, which is the difficult thing here. Uh, and one of the things that people are beginning to say is actually where it sits is less relevant making it easy to access the findability factor uh, is the most important thing. And the little buzzword these days is called intelligent search. Uh, that's one aspect of it. And of course, and we're easy we're, to draw. Oh, please, Jonty. I was just going to say, and we're just shortly going to move on to uh, Dennis, who's going to take us through some of the, the ways that searching can, can work. Can work easy, yeah. And although, you know, it, it's easy to draw, I am a big fan of always shoving a vision up for people to know what they're actually aiming for. And that, this is my contribution to it, it just in terms of a, a resource in the business. What we're really trying to do is, is, is to develop a single version of the truth that works increasingly across those different channels. Note on the right hand side, those of you, by the way, who are doing peer-to-peer -peer customer support already, that's another fantastic source of, of, of knowledge. And the trick here is how do we get that into a single accessible uh, resource for us so that we can increase our fixed first time capability so that that customer experience of just do it fast, just do it right first time is enabled and our NPS and all the rest of it go up. And as a result of that, we start to see some of the monetary and financial and commercial uh, benefits coming through that I showed you halfway uh, through this particular thing. So there's a bit of scene setting, trying to make some links for you in your mind between knowledge and also some of the key strategic themes uh, that are currently taking uh, place in the organization. Hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to hand you back back to Dennis, who's going to look at some of the more practical aspects now of making knowledge management work. Okay, we're just going to pass the uh, baton across to uh, to Dennis. And uh, thanks, Martin. Dennis, if you'd like to share your screen. Wonderful. There we are. Thanks, Martin. Um, Pleasure. Some encouraging things there, particularly with light of um, empathy and uh, individual personal contact. I think. Um, very important areas that are often overlooked when we talk about knowledge management and where it can help. More often than not, we look at the hard factors and how it drives return on investments. I think this is an area that we would like to touch on briefly. We, we've talked about the symptoms, we've heard some theory, we've had some market um, analysis, and I guess what we want to share with you now is uh, some, some ways that we think are helpful ways of looking at knowledge base and take it out of the theoretical element and make it a little bit more practical and um, achievable uh, uh, to, to at least find a place to start or where do you start with knowledge management. One of the questions that we often get is um, what sort of tool do I need um, to do this right and I guess before we even attempt to answer this question, we, we tend to use this little triangle, we find this very useful and so do our customers nowadays and basically what we're trying to do is to ask uh, the questions around what sort of questions do you get, think about uh, what type of questions you're getting in your organization, are they in, of information nature, transactional behavior, advice seeking, think about questions of 
of your customers, um, uh, bills are not right, I want to pay something, or there is a, pro a problem with something, or where can I find something, uh, make it simple and categorize those type of questions in those sections. That then allows you to start to think what type of knowledge management strategies you can deploy. Knowledge management is not one thing, it's not one system, it should be a series of strategies and tool sets that you can deploy. Um, FAQ is still a very, very good way of dealing with information, and so is search. Um, whenever there is an interaction, transaction, something that needs to be done, a great opportunity to push it out to the web and use web form and let the customers do that themselves. Um, something needs to be fixed or an advice, um, this is where guided help uh, comes in and, and really can help um, shape the dialogue between the advisor and the customer in a more factual way. So how do you make this work? Um, well, first of all, interestedly, we tend to focus on a soft area, which is around perception. Um, uh, more often than not, we see that in particular more complex queries, there can often be a disconnect between the customer's perception of their issue and how the agents might interpret that. Um, email as a working could potentially be a whole range of issues and could lead to assumptions being made on the part of the agent. Um, by building a layer that can provide best practice around how to move the customer from problem perception to problem diagnosis and subsequent resolution can really assist with the end-to-end -end handling time as well as reducing the number of repeat calls. And so what's interesting here is that actually by working off perception you can drive the two uh, most important return of, uh, of your investment, i.e. the end-to-end -end of handling time and the number of repeat, talk, uh, the repeat calls. Our next area is an area that um, uh, we are pretty sharp on lately, and it's the difference between finding things and searching for things. We've made a point earlier, and it, it was quite apparent in Martin's slide deck as well, that searching for things is not the same thing as finding them, and searching for things doesn't necessarily mean that you reduce the amount of time it takes to conclude a call or keep people waiting on hold. Um, a knowledge base should help you, or should help the agents, to find the right information that they need more quickly. But you do that by using terms and phrases that mean something to them. Um, it, this, it doesn't mean that the information itself necessarily needs to be moved. It just needs to provide improved findability to the content. It can also work as a quick win for agents in the project. So when you're thinking of starting a project, this is a great area. Your agents will see an immediate improvement, which will obviously help to gain confidence in, in the project overall. eGain itself uses index technologies and search against your existing documents and it allows us to very quickly uh, import content easily. I think the confidence bit is the bit that's really important here. Um, early on, if you can get the buy-in from your agents and build the confidence, that's a great foundation uh, to start with. We've briefly touched on consistency and best practice. I think this is key. Um, best practice and, and, and in particular like consistency, we've seen it in the poll, it came across very, very strong that inconsistency answers, uh, there's a strong sentiment to that. Um, having all your agents using the contact center best practice and the knowledge instilled into their best agents for the single knowledge base uh, clearly allows for calls to be handled more consistently, there's no more different answers to the same query. Um, and it can also add to the customer satisfaction and clearly the first time fix um, reduction of repeat calls will affect your net promoter score. It's as simple as that. And it'd be quite interesting if, if anyone in the audience is using net promoter score, if they could uh, pop, the, pop some comments on uh, how useful that's been in, in the comments box below. I guess the key here, in particular with the best practice, is this best practice, this information, for it to work, it needs to be delivered in time. It needs to be delivered on the right time um, that's what we refer to as just-in-time knowledge. Um, having a knowledge base allows you to support your agents at the point at which they need it. Um, supporting information can be presented at the right time during call. Um, we, we already know that just having best practice documents is just not enough. Um, it needs to be promoted and pushed at the right level of the conversation. The knowledge base can also be looked at in a slightly different way. I think. Uh, we tend to look at it as a sort of a big library with some intelligence into it. Uh, 
a creative way of, of using a knowledge base is that it can actually do something for you. Whilst you're on the phone, it could go out and pr probe and query a system to see if a service is still available so that you don't have to put the, the, the customer on hold. It could be used to, to, to provide you with all sorts of critical information whilst you're actually still engaging with your customer. Um, it also works for new products. If you think about the rate at which we are launching new products to be more competitive and, and, and diversify our offering, if you put the information in the knowledge base, actually we are dramatically reducing the need for the classical training. We, we are, if the agent can find the information, we're consistent in the way to present it, uh, the agent will be confident enough to use this information and talk about this product as if it was there uh, a very long time. We're all doing this, whatever we look at knowledge management, to um, ultimately have a return on investment. Uh, and we could talk about the hard elements and the softer elements. I guess we would like to touch uh, about, uh, on both. We would uh, really um, advise here to be pragmatic with this. Um, you should understand where the knowledge base can be of greatest value. If I can bring you back to the triangle slide whereby we try to sort of capture and categorize what type of questions, think then about the 80-20 rule. Um, which 20% of those type of questions are actually driving the volume of the calls? Those are the areas that you want to focus on if you want to make sure that you um, execute greatly against. And we've got a comment in from uh, Aidan. Aidan says that one best practice is looking at the percentage fix rate of a step in, the, in a process and the ability to move it up or down in the troubleshooting list. Uh, and that allows for consistency with the, you know, potentially the advantage of a better uh, average handling time, uh, a first time fix or first call resolution. So I guess that's all about really prioritizing that, 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 uh, where the results are likely to come. I think that's a very powerful example. Um, what we sh should f um, remember here that when we are uh, talking about implementing knowledge management strategy or knowledge based systems is that the buying from the agents is critical. This is not an IT project. This is a project that uh, should drive adoption and it's important that very, very early on we get the agents involved. Um, don't spend a year trying to build the best knowledge base in this in, um, uh, available. It's all around um, thinking about your phasing, your phased approach, apply, apply the 80-20 rule and deploy your project accordingly. Um, from the very start, and we touched on this uh, the first time we had a question, this is important that you, you, you keep the information up to date. Um, it, it sometimes is seen as an overhead to have a knowledge base and to think about having a team maintaining it, but clearly if you look at the results that you can achieve, it's a very, very small, pay, uh, small price to pay. Um, Talking about some hard facts, if we look across the various industries where we operate, first-time resolution can easily be driven up between 20 and 30 percent. Those are significant numbers. The reduction in staff and in training staff we see by around 30 percent. Again, a big number. Um, we see dramatic results in average handle time, and sometimes uh, it leads to no wrap-up time at all. The wrapping up and the closing of the case is actually done whilst you're still talking to your customer. Um, an added benefit is the reduction of repeat calls, obviously linked to us being more consistent. You could expect a 10% improvement there. But those are all the hard facts that are very, very important indeed when we try to compile a business case and try to obtain funding for what we do. There are also soft benefits. Here, here in eGain, we really believe that there's a direct correlation between the agent's confidence and how the customer engagement and the customer dialogues take place. And ultimately, what we do this for is to have a positive outcome. We believe that if the agent is more confident in using the knowledge base, it would drive and shape the conversation with the, with the customer. Um, it also allows the agent to focus on this conversation. And Martin has briefly touched on the opportunity to cross an upsell. That will come across uh, more real, less artificial if you have a genuine engagement and you can concentrate on the conversation that you have. Um, even in environments where the overall satisfaction is very high, uh, we, still see, we still see opportunities there to drive um, uh, it up even further and try to become best of breed by using a knowledge base. Um, ultimately, we believe happy agents means happy customers. Yeah, and I think there's a, an awful lot of research that uh, 
that really uh, really uh, ties up with that. Um, we've got some very interesting um, comments back from uh, coming back overall. So uh, what I'll do now is I'll just um, uh, would like to get some uh, validation before we get into questions. Um, of, in the audience, if you'd like to perhaps put your uh, answer into the question box uh, below, is where you think the biggest barriers are to deploying knowledge management in the contact center. So if you could type, these, uh, type this into your uh, question box on the right-hand side with your comments on where you think the, the biggest barriers to deploying knowledge man management in the contact center uh, lie. So just we've got a couple coming couple coming through there, so if you could uh, just uh, answer that question. What are the biggest barriers to deploying knowledge man management in the contact center? Uh, we're now going to dive into uh, answer, uh, questions and answers. We've got a, quite a number of uh, comments coming through, and Martin will be uh, choosing the uh, best question or best comment for the uh, bottle of champagne we talked about earlier. We're also joined by Vicky Lister from eGain, who can answer any uh, technical questions that you have on, uh, on how the eGain uh, e -gain product uh, works. Um, the first question, and uh, we've also got Martin online as well, is um, a, a, a question from uh, uh, Bamikole who asks, how can a CSA manage new product information? I guess this really, uh, Dennis, goes straight to the heart of a part of a, a knowledge base. Is that something that's pushed for them? Is it something they've got to they've got to kind of click on links to find? How can this, this a new CSA get the information to that new product information? I guess um, this is the, this is an area that, that, that consists of a couple of levels, I guess. There's a technical level here, but there's also an organizational level. Um, how you could deal with that is by thinking about the commonalities um, across whenever you introduce products and the type of questions that you may receive as an agent and try to think about how that information should be presented. If you then have a knowledge base that has got the capability to push that information forward and the information that's then presented to the agent is the same and is consistent as it is for each and every other product, agents become more aware and adapt trying to find the unique attributes of that product and talk to that without the need to go in depth and become an expert. I guess what we're trying to remove is an element of every agent needing to be an expert in each and every product for it to be able to have an articulate conversation with a customer. Um, I think one of the other things that, that uh, can help as well is when you introduce new knowledge into the knowledge base is that actually people are told that there's something new there. So. Uh, instead of having to send around emails and, and memos around the organization, they go into the knowledge base, they open up the knowledge base, and the first thing that they see is that there are, some, there are some new products. However, through the consistency of presenting uh, through the knowledge base, then everything will be in the right place. It will just be new product details. Uh, excellent. And, and Martin, I guess looking at the other end of the scale, uh, there's a question here about long-term agents. Long-term agents who think they know best will only tend to use a knowledge management for, to circumvent uh, disciplinary actions. Uh, Aidan writes, uh, however, the engagement of them will actually really help to shape the knowledge-based content through indexing and subject, subject matter updates. Does, does that sort of tie in with, with your opinion of, of the agent who knows best? Uh, yes, it does. Um, it's interesting that uh, Aidan has been contributing quite a bit here, and I've just checked him out online. He's, he's a bit of a veteran on this particular topic. So it's interesting that if, if you've watched knowledge management, um, as Aidan obviously has done, and, and anybody really from eGain, there's definitely waves and milestones and things that happen. And I think one of them is that you, you, you get an initial success from having organized the knowledge. And then one of the outcomes of that is actually people don't use the system any longer because they've learned it. Uh, and Aiden's kind of picking that up, you know, which is after a while, you know, the most experienced agents break free if you want and do their own free form stuff. So what he's suggesting as an answer to his own question really is that you need to reprofile their involvement and get them involved in the creation and the curating of that knowledge as opposed to simply being consumers of it. Um, and I think that actually, you know, knowledge management as a strategy is a constantly evolving one. 
in which you need to be anticipating the next milestone and the next upside and downside uh, and, and really trying to be smart in terms of people keeping people on the case involved and in believing in its value. Excellent. And we've also got lots and lots of feedback about the barriers to knowledge management. Uh, Karthik says it's the leadership drive which comes through in a number of people of getting, uh, getting overall buy-in. We've got things like cost and complexity, um, top, uh, top management, uh, cost is one of the, the elements. There's also a number of factors such as linking to existing technology um, and uh, client restrictions. Um, and I guess there's also a, a sort of group I'm starting to see about uh, very much a sort of maintaining the integrity of answers and, and how, you, how you manage the, the, the system. And I, I guess, Vicky, that's something you've had a lot of, lot of uh, dealings with. Have you, have you got any tips on, on how to best keep the knowledge base up to date? Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a few things uh, in there. So, so one is, yes, certainly the consistency of the, the information that's put into the knowledge base and ensuring that it is correct and that it has the right tone in there. So you're saying the right things in the right way. And obviously, depending on the organization, you know, there, there may be uh, a legal side uh, to that, so you have to say the right things at the right time, so, so it becomes very important. So you need to have some kind of approval process when you're putting knowledge into the knowledge base, but that approval process shouldn't make it so difficult that, that people don't, don't do it. Uh, however, it is essential because uh, as soon as anybody can start adding in uh, information into the knowledge base, you start going back to, to where you started from. So you start off you know, with uh, you know, 50 answers to the, to the same question in, in slightly different ways. And that's, that's really what we're trying to avoid. So an approval process is, uh, is fundamental. However, it needs to work with the organization and not against the organization. Yeah, I, I was talking with one contact center manager yes, uh, recently uh, who had an uh, adopt an answer a scheme in, uh, in their contact centre <laughs> where they actually encourage and actually put incentives behind uh, people adopting answers. Right. And we've got a, a comment from Paul who says, shouldn't the, the customer service agent be the prime source of new pieces of knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, i.e. requesting someone creates an answer to a customer query? And that there is that element of someone coming new into the organisation um, is actually probably you know, someone who's best, best to adapt to that. Absolutely. So again, the the suggestion and feedback loop is is really part of that uh, that approval process. Wonderful. 